Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, this has been a high day already. What a wonderful privilege and joy to come into your presence and sing praises to your holy name. What a joy it is to be able to speak with you in prayer, to hear you speaking to us through the ministry of your word, and just to enjoy Christian fellowship together. What a wonderful, awesome privilege it is to be in your house this morning. And Father, we ask that as we open your holy word, that you will remove all secular thoughts from our minds. Help us not to think about lunch or about leaving. Help us, Lord, to reflect and meditate upon your holy word. And we thank you, Father, for hearing and answering our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Bible is very clear in telling us that within its pages is found salvation. I'd like to begin this morning by reading a verse that probably most of us are very well acquainted with, Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8. This verse deals specifically with the endurance and eternity of Scripture. Here we find in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8 the following words. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. God's word is as eternal as he is. It does not wither and it does not fade. And within its pages of Scripture, we can find salvation. Notice John chapter 5 and verse 39. John chapter 5 and verse 39, we'll also read verse 40, where Jesus is speaking to the Jews of his day. And I want you to notice how Jesus stated that the Scriptures bring salvation. It says there, and probably the best translation is the one in the New King James, which I am reading. You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. So Jesus is stating that within the pages of the Bible is found eternal life. Notice also 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 14 through 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 14 through 16, where we have the same idea coming forth, that from the Scriptures comes forth salvation. It says there, 2 Timothy 3, 14, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known, he's speaking to Timothy, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Notice once again the idea that the scriptures bring salvation. And then verse 16 says, what scripture is useful for? It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So in the pages of scripture, we find salvation. There is no other place in the world where a person can find salvation other than in the Word of God. But this morning, I don't want to focus only on the Scriptures as the revelation of the path of salvation. I would like to speak about the Scriptures as the great detector of error. Because in these last days, Satan has incredible delusions planned for the human race. And the only protection we have is by going to the great detector of error, Holy Scripture. About a week ago, 
I ended a series of meetings in Germany, the same church that I had visited nine years ago in the year 2001. Now nine years ago, a certain gentleman came to all of my meetings. He was not baptized. But this time, nine years later, he came back once again. It was interesting to see him coming to the meetings every single night because it started on a Monday night and ended on a Sabbath evening. On Wednesday evening, three days after I started the meetings, he came to me at the door after the sermon and he pointed to the program, a little program that the pastor had printed, and he said, Pastor, when are you going to talk about this specific subject? And I hadn't seen the program before. I looked at it. It said, uh, what happens when a person dies? Now, I hadn't told the pastor what I was going to preach about, but he prepared a little flyer, uh, and he sent it out. And one of those topics that he put on the flyer was the state of the dead, which I did not have in the series of sermons that I was going to present. So I told him that I wasn't going to speak on that specific issue, but that if he wanted to, the pastor and I could go and visit him in his home, and we would be glad to answer any questions he had about the state of the dead. So two days later, on Friday, uh, the pastor, Pastor Rangel, and myself went to the home of this gentleman to visit with him. I had visited him with him nine years previously. Now, he, let me give you a little bit of background so you understand where I'm coming from. This man's wife, who was from Venezuela, uh, had been for many years a member of the Jehovah's Witness Church. Now, uh, this gentleman had never become a Jehovah's Witness, but he had attended church with her many times, but he was never baptized into that church. But he told us, as we were visiting there at his table in the kitchen, that he had a falling out with the church of the Jehovah's Witnesses, and uh, it was because of a bad testimony that was given by one of the elders of the church. And so he and his wife had quit coming to church. Now, you need to understand that Jehovah's Witnesses, to a great degree, believe in the state of the dead like Seventh-day Adventists do. They believe that the dead know nothing until the moment of the resurrection. And so this individual and his wife undoubtedly had embraced the idea that the dead don't know anything, that they remain in the grave sleeping until Jesus comes. And then this man opened his heart to us. He said, five months ago, my wife lost a devastating bout with cancer, and she died. He told us that he had been married for a period of 22 years. And as he talked to us, I could tell that he was devastated by his wife's death. In fact, he cried his eyes out. He cried like a baby as he talked about losing his wife five months ago. And then he started sharing with us some information about how he attempted to deal with his grief. He told us that after his devastating loss, he searched for literature that might bring comfort to his heart because of his wife's passing so that he could get over his terrible grief. Through the recommendation of a friend, he came across the works of a Swiss psychiatrist by the name of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Now, I don't know if any of you are acquainted with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, uh, but she did extensive work on the phenomenon of dying. In fact, she wrote a very famous book titled On Death and Dying, which was published in the year 1969. In this work, for those of you who, who have not been acquainted with uh, this woman, uh, she proposed that people who are dying go through five specific stages. They go through the stage of denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally acceptance. And so this man told us that um, he had been exposed to the writings of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and that uh, she had brought comfort to his soul. Now, I remembered personally Elizabeth Kubler-Ross because in 1972, when I was studying at Andrews University, she was invited to a nursing symposium to talk about 
the phenomenon of dying. This was only a, a period of three years after she had written her famous book on death and dying. Now at first Elizabeth Kubler-Ross did not believe that the dead uh, were uh, survived after the moment of death. But in the late 1970s, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross uh, started uh, studying the phenomenon of out-of-body experiences. And she got involved in spiritualism, and actually she began attempting to communicate with the dead. And she came to the conclusion that Christianity was very compatible with reincarnation. This 72-year-old gentleman described how he believed that dead people go through a dark tunnel after death and come out on the other side in a glorious realm of light where there is incomparable peace and love. He also shared that a friend of his who had lost his wife had also seen his wife recently appear to him and bring comfort to his soul. Now what would our response be to this man who was suffering such deep grief? Well, we cried along with him. I'm not a crying person, as you know, but a few tears came to my eyes as well as I saw the deep grief that he was going through. Then I said to him, more than anything, I believe that you would want to see your wife and know that she is happy, happy right now. Isn't that right? He said, yes, I would like that more than anything. Then I shared with him the Bible truth that at the very beginning, God had told Adam and Eve that, he was, that if they sinned, they were going to die. And that the devil had said, if you sin, you're not going to die, but you're going to live forever. You're going to be like God. Then I shared with him about the experience of the witch of Endor, who seemingly, although she didn't, brought Samuel from the dead to communicate with King Saul. I shared with him what I, I knew he already was acquainted with because he had attended the Jehovah's Witness uh, group for a period of about 12 years. And then I presented before him a hypothetical case. I said, supposing that your wife right now or somebody that looks like your wife should appear in that doorway. And I pointed to the door that led from the kitchen into the living room. Suppose that she talked this with the same voice, looked exactly the same, remembered your times together, and told you that she was in a better place. Would you believe that this is your wife because you desperately miss her and would like to be with her? This would be a most trying experience. I told him, your ears, your heart, your mind, your feelings, all tell you that this is your wife. Would you go by what the Bible says, or would you follow what your heart, your eyes, your ears, and your feelings tell you? You see, the Bible is clear. The living know that they will die, but the dead know not anything. When I said this, he opened his eyes wide, and for a few seconds, which appeared to be an eternity, he kept absolute silence. After a few more words of comfort, we prayed with him, and we left. On Sabbath morning, Friday evening, he didn't come to the meetings. On Sabbath morning, he didn't come to the meetings. On Saturday night, he didn't come either. I trust and hope that he was some other place in another commitment. He seemed to receive well uh, what we said. However, I told the pastor, you need to visit this man right away and find out why he didn't come Friday night and Sabbath, because it is urgent that he understand that according to the Bible, even though it looks like his wife, it sounds like his wife, she kn knew things that only she knew during your lifetime, you need to understand. And, and he said, I know this, that this was not his wife. And so he promised that he was going to go and visit him. Now the title of our study today is The Acid Test. 
Now what do we mean by the acid test? Well, the fact is, if you want to test metals to see if they are precious metals, what usually is done is a drop of a very strong acid, like nitric, nitric acid, is put on the surface of the metal, and if this is uh, just plain old common ordinary metal, not a precious metal, uh, you'll find that the acid sizzles and it bubbles. But when citric acid is placed on gold or silver on precious metals, it stands unaffected. There is no fizzling and there is no bubbling. In other words, the acid test is a decisive, immediate, cheap and simple way to test whether something is true gold or not. You see, you can't rely on people telling you that this metal is gold, or because it looks like gold, and some people even, have you ever seen them kind of, I don't know whether you can taste gold or not, but they kind of gnaw or chew on the gold. You know, you can't depend on your sight, you can't depend on what people tell you, you must apply the absolute acid test, or else you might end up with fool's gold, which is totally worthless. Now folks, Satan has his eyes clearly focused on planet Earth. He is planning to deceive the whole world in these last days by one principal deception. Allow me to read you several statements from Scripture where we're told that this is what the devil intends to do. And by the way, he's deceived most of the world today, even the Christian world. Matthew chapter 24 and verses 23 through 25. Matthew chapter 24 and verses 23 through 25. And these are verses that we've read many times before. It says there, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders. And notice who the target of, the, of Satan's deceptions are. You know, sometimes we think that he, his intention is to deceive the world. No, his de- intention is to deceive the church. Notice the last part of this statement. It says in verse 24, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, whom? Even the elect. And then Jesus says, He's talking to the disciples, He says, See, I have told you beforehand, so that you will not be deceived. The devil is going to perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the very elect. The elect are his target. The book of Revelation adds its testimony in chapter 16 and verses 13 and 14. Revelation chapter 16 verses 13 and 14. And we're acquainted with this passage because we've read it before many times. It's speaking about the threefold alliance at the end of time, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, and how the devil is going to use them to attempt to deceive the human race. It says there, uh, John speaking through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs, They are spirits of what? What are demons? They are the devil's what? The devil's angels. A third of the angels fell from heaven with him. And so it says, For they are spirits of demons, performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world. Notice, he wants to deceive the whole world, to gather them to the great battle of that great day of God Almighty. And Christians say, well, Christians won't be deceived by this. Jesus says that He would deceive, if possible, even the elect. Now allow me to read you another passage that shows that Christians are in view. Matthew chapter 7 and verses 23, uh, 21 through 23. Matthew chapter 7 and verses 21 through 23. 
very sobering passage about people who will come to Jesus in the last day, and they'll have something very interesting to say to Him. Notice Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, are these Christians? Yes or no? Yes. They're Christians, because a non-Christian would not call Jesus Lord, Lord. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Who are the ones uh, that will be recognized and enter the kingdom of heaven? Those who what? Who do the will of the Father in heaven. Not those who say, Lord, Lord. Verse 22, listen carefully. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. Once again, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Whose name? The name of Jesus. Are these Christians? Or are people who seemingly are Christians? Absolutely. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And then what does it say next? And cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name. Who are the ones that are going to be doing the signs and wonders at the end of time? Is it non-Christians or Christians? It is Christians, but Christians that Jesus does not recognize. Why doesn't He recognize them? Notice verse 23, And then I will declare to them, some people say, well, they, they cast out demons, uh, you know, while uh, they were fine with Jesus. And they prophesied while their relationship was genuine with Jesus. And they did many wonders while they were with Jesus. Later on, they apostatized. But that's not true. Because we find here Jesus saying, I what? I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Christians who practice lawlessness? You say, come on, pastor, what are you talking about? Do you know that that word lawlessness there is the same word that is translated in 1 John 3, 4, transgression of the law? Only in 1 John 3, 4, in the King James, it's translated, sin is transgression of the law. It's the very same word. And if you go to the New King James, it says that sin is lawlessness. So it's the very same word. So is there some issue relating to the law at the end of time? People who claim Jesus, but they're trampling on God's holy law. Absolutely. Are they going to be performing miracles? Yes. Are they going to be prophesying? Yes. Are they going to be casting out demons? Absolutely. All kinds of supernatural things happening in the church that leads them to think that they are on God's side. But Jesus says, I never knew you. Folks, our only safeguard at the end is going to be the only safeguard that Adam and Eve had at the beginning. You see, what is going to happen at the end already happened at the beginning. We're not going to read this passage because you're all acquainted with it. Genesis chapter 3 and verses 1 through 6. If you read that passage carefully, you're going to find that the devil did several things. He performed a miracle, first of all, because he, snakes don't talk, and he gave the snake the appearance of a quality of talking. He misquoted Scripture. He appealed to Eve's reasoning powers, contrary to God's Word. He played mind games with her. He appealed to the tense testimony of her senses. The fruit looks good. It probably tastes good. And he led Adam to listen to another person's voice. He used all kinds of methods, and his strategy was just very clear. His strategy was to lead Adam and Eve to disobey the clear, objective Word of God. You see, God said, don't eat. Doesn't matter what people say, doesn't matter what your eyes say, doesn't matter what your mind says, doesn't matter anything. God was saying, obey my word and you will be safe. Disobey my word and you will fall. You see, folks, the devil has all kinds of wiles prepared for the world at this end of time. 
He will appeal to our reasoning powers. He will appear to our senses. He will appeal to our feelings. He will misquote Scripture. He will lead other people to say things so that we will buy those things that are contrary to God's holy word. You see, the same controversy at the end is the controversy that existed at the very beginning. It is whether you will follow strictly God's Word or whether you will follow the testimony of your senses, your reason, what other people say, etc. I want you to go with me to Isaiah chapter 8 and verses 19 and 20. Isaiah chapter 8 verses 19 and 20. We usually quote verse 20. But you know, verse 20 has a context. Verse 20 has a context. Now I want you to notice what the context is because it has to do with the state of the dead. See, Isaiah 8.20 has to do with the state of the dead, which we began our study with this morning. Isaiah chapter 8, verses 19 and 20. And when they say to you, Seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, Does that have to do with the state of the dead? Oh, you better believe it. It becomes clearer. Should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? And now notice what the acid test is. There is an acid test. And that is whether you obey what God says or whether you listen to wizards, or whether you listen to people who claim to communicate with the dead, whether you follow what your eyes tell you, or what your reason tells you, or what other people tell you. The acid test is clear. Verse 20, to the law, that would be the writings of Moses, at this time when Isaiah spoke, and to the testimony, that would be the writings of the prophets, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. What is the acid test of every phenomenon in the world? The acid test is what? Following what God says where? What God says in His Holy Word. The Bible is the great detector of error. It is the light that dispels the darkness. You know, some people say, well, you need to know the errors that people are teaching so that you can refute them with the truth. I've never known that you have to know darkness in order to turn on the light. The best way to know darkness is by knowing the truth, by following what God says in His Holy Word. Yet today, people follow all kinds of authorities in place of the Bible. Things such as science, philosophy, feelings, emotions, signs and wonders, and what others write and say. Some of our own theologians within the Seventh-day Adventist Church are saying that the Bible was fine for a pre-scientific simplistic society, but that today we have far more light and we are far more educated and sophisticated than they. I'd like to read you a statement, powerful statement from the writings of Ellen White. You know, I remember this statement when I visited the city of Worms. Uh, just uh, a little over a week ago where Martin Luther stood and he said, Here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. And he stood upon Scripture. I want you to notice this statement. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. Did you understand that? But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible only as the standard of all doctrines, that's your beliefs, and the basis of all reforms. And then she says this, the opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, the creeds or decisions of ecclesiastical councils, as numerous and discordant as are the churches which they represent, the voice of the majority, not one, nor all of these should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith. Before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plain, thus saith the Lord in its support. Amen. And we have the example of Jesus Christ, 
who when the devil met him, the devil used all kinds of mind games on Jesus. And he also appealed to his senses. During the first temptation, he did not appear to Jesus as the devil. He appeared as an angel of light. There's three chapters in Selected Messages, Volume 1, on the three temptations of Christ. Powerful chapters. He used all kinds of specious arguments, tried to get into the mind of Jesus, appealed to his senses, appealed to his feelings. You know, when he showed him all the kingdoms of the world, he said, you think that you have to go die. You know what sufferings you're going to go through in order to gain the kingdoms of the world back. I'll give you an easier way. All you have to do is just bow for a second and worship me, and it'll all be yours. No cross necessary. And so the devil used all of these methods on Jesus Christ to try and deceive him. But every time that the devil came to Jesus with the temptation, Jesus said what? It is written. He went by the testimony of the Word of God. In the Great Controversy, page 593, Ellen White had this to say, The last great delusion is soon to open before us. Antichrist is to perform his marvelous works in our sight. Listen carefully now. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true. Is the counterfeit going to be just a cheap counterfeit? Uh-uh. I'm going to read you another statement in a moment. It's going to blow you away. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. By their testimony, every statement and every miracle must be tested. Once again, by their testimony, every statement and every miracle must be tested. This will be the acid test. Do you know that in the end of time, other Christians are going to come to you, they're going to say, hey, how do you say that the dead are dead? Haven't you heard of everyone who is having out-of-body experiences, people who have died, and they come back and they tell the same story. They went through a dark tunnel, came out into a realm of light, and then when God told them that it's not your time yet, and they come back through the tunnel, haven't you, haven't you heard what's happening? Yes, yes, I definitely heard that. And by the way, don't you know that the Bible says that the rich man went to hell? And that Lazarus went to the bosom of Abraham when he died? And doesn't the Bible say, absent from the body and present with the Lord, that Paul wanted to be? Doesn't the Bible say, don't fear him who is able to kill the body but not kill the soul? What about the preaching to the spirits in prison? What about the dead who stand before God? You see, there's all kinds of problematic texts in the New Testament. We have to come to terms with these texts. We have to be able to understand them and explain them. That's why several years ago I recorded a series with Secrets Unsealed called Misunderstood Texts on the State of the Dead. It's available through Secrets Unsealed. I did that specifically studying these verses because someday people are going to come and they're going to use these texts and we're going to have to have an explanation. We can't just depend on the text that we always use. Well, the Bible says, the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. That's an important text, and there are other important verses. But we must be able to come to grips with these verses that people bring to us. Several years ago, I was teaching, and I probably have told this story before. We have a lot of visitors today. Um, I was uh, teaching theology in the city of Medellin, Colombia. And one day I went downtown and, uh, to uh, buy some merchandise at a store which is similar to a, K uh, to a Walmart or a Kmart. And um, I went, I, I picked up the stuff that I was going to buy, went to the uh, cash register to pay, and uh, paid with the 10,000 peso bill. And uh, the girl at the, um, the cash register took the bill, she put it in the, in the light, and then she kind of crumpled it in her hand. And all of a sudden she calls a policeman, she says to the policeman, come here. I said, oh, what's wrong here? So she says to the policeman, hey, this man just gave me a counterfeit 10,000 peso bill. You know, here in the United States, you're innocent until proven guilty. <laughs> Down there, you're guilty until proven innocent. So I was somewhat concerned. So that po another policeman joined him. They each took me by one arm. I went to a back room. 
and they started interrogating me. Where do you have the machinery? <laughs> I looked at him and I said, what machinery? I'm not a counterfeiter. He says, well, where did you get that bill? I said, I don't know. I don't keep track of where I get each and every bill from. And then he asked me a question. He said, um, where are you from? What is your work? I looked at him and I said, well, I'm a theology teacher at our Seventh-day Adventist college or a university, uh, Ecolven. And when I said that, you know, the expression on his and the other policeman's face changed for the better. <laughs> Praise the Lord, they had a good concept of our school. And so one of the policemen says to me, you teach theology at the Seventh-day Adventist institution? Well, that's a real good school. I said, hallelujah, praise the Lord, I was saying to myself. <laughs> and then he says to me, I want to spare you from having to go through this experience again. I'm going to go and I'm going to get the counterfeit bill. I'm going to ask her to give me a genuine 10,000 peso bill, and I'm going to bring it back, and I'm going to show you how to distinguish the genuine from the counterfeit. So first of all, he took the genuine 10,000 peso bill, he put it in the light, he said, look, there's a brown line running through the, through the bill. You see it? Took the counterfeit one, no brown line. Huh, interesting. Then he took the genuine bill and he crumpled it in his hand and it's made out of paper that kind of starts blossoming like a flower. He wrinkled the counterfeit bill and it just stayed wrinkled. Then he said, he put the genuine bill in the light, he said, look, at the head of, of Simon Bolivar is very, very clear in the genuine bill. Look, in the, in the counterfeit bill, it's kind of hazy, it's not clear. He said, really? And then he took the genuine bill and put it under a black light that he had there, and the two circles on the bill shone a deep blue. And then he put the counterfeit one under, and it didn't shine at all. And so I said, ah, now nobody's going to dupe me. Anytime I get a bill, I'm going to check it out. What did I know, what did I need to know in order to detect the counterfeit? I had to know the characteristics of the genuine bill. That was the acid test. So every time that I went to a cash register to pay after that, and I paid with the 10 or 20,000 peso bill. The girl at the cash register would go through the process, she would put it in the light and so on, and when she gave me some large bills back, I would take the bills and I would look at them in the light. <laughs> and one day one of the ladies at the cash register says to me, what, don't you trust me? I said, I trust you as much as you trust me. Early Writings, pages 87 and 88. Powerful statement. Listen carefully to this. The devil is going to use the state of the dead to deceive almost the whole world, with the exception of a small remnant. Listen to what she says. I saw that the saints, remember what the target of the devil is, it's he will deceive if possible who? The elect. She says, I saw that the saints must get a thorough understanding of present truth, which they will be obliged to maintain from the Scriptures. What must be obtained? A thorough what? Understanding of present truth. Then she says, they must understand the state of the dead. And if you think you understand it simply because you know Ecclesiastes 9 verses 5 and 6, think again. The devil has strong delusions planned for you. We have to be settled in our mind upon what the state of the dead is according to Scripture. They must understand the state of the dead, for the spirits of devils will yet appear to them. To whom? To the people of the world? The devil already has those deceived. When she says that the spirits of devils will yet appear to them, she's talking about the saints. She says, professing to be Beloved, relative, beloved friends and relatives who will declare to them that the Sabbath has been changed. Also other unscriptural doctrines. They will do all in their power, listen to this, to excite sympathy. That's appealing to your emotions. And will work miracles 
before them to confirm what they declare. Now where's our protection? We see it, we hear it, we feel it, all of our being is involved. What is our protection? She says, the people of God must be prepared to withstand these spirits with the Bible truth that the dead know not anything, and that they who appear to them are the spirits of devils. Our minds must not be taken up with the things around us, but must be occupied with the present truth. What must we occupy our minds with? With the present truth and a preparation to give a reason of our hope with meekness and fear. We must seek wisdom from on high that we may stand in this day of error and delusion. In another sobering statement, Great Controversy, page 552, listen to this. Speaking about the devil, he has power to bring before men the appearance of, depart of their departed friends. You don't think the devil has the ability to disguise himself? The Bible says that he can disguise himself as an angel of light. He can appear to you uh, disguised as a relative who passed away. He knows all about you because he followed your track. And he'll appeal to your emotions, to your reason. He'll play mind games. He'll use other people to try and convince you. He has power to bring before men the appearance of their departed friends. Listen carefully. The counterfeit is perfect. What is a perfect counterfeit? It's when the government cannot even tell that a, that a bill, a hundred dollar bill, is counterfeit. That is a perfect counterfeit. So what is our protection? How do you detect a perfect counterfeit? Let's continue reading. The counterfeit is perfect. The familiar look, the words, the tone are reproduced. What does reproduce mean? Exactly the same. Are reproduced with marvelous distinctness. Many are comforted with the assurance that their loved ones are enjoying the bliss of heaven. And without suspicion of danger, they give ear to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Signs of the Times, August 26, 1889. See, Ellen White is simply amplifying what we noticed already in Scripture. I'm just reading some confirmation from the Spirit of Prophecy. Signs of the Times, August 26, 1889, she says, It is Satan's most successful and fascinating delusion. That is, appearing as departed relatives. One calculated, listen to this, one calculated to take hold of the sympathies of those who have loved, laid loved ones in the grave. See, the devil knows that people are sad and in anguish over their relatives who had died. He knows what people long for. And so he says, I'm going to supply what people long for, but you cannot allow your longing to contradict Scripture. She continues saying, evil angels come in the form of, these, of those loved ones and relate incidents connected with their lives and perform acts which they performed while living. In this way, they lead persons to believe that their dead friends are angels. Listen to that. Do you know most of the Christian world today believes that angels are really the spirits of the dead? Ellen White knew it way back over a hundred years ago. Once again, she says, in this way they lead persons to believe that their dead friends are angels. Folks, the angels existed before God created this world. Job 38 makes that clear. They sang when this world was created. They continue saying, in this way they lead persons to believe that their dead friends are angels hovering over them and communicating with them. These evil angels who assume to be the deceased friends are regarded with a certain idolatry, and with many their word has greater weight than the word of God. Listen to what Ellen White says is going to happen with the religious world. What the religious world is going to tell God's remnant, God's small remnant. You say, well, how can the majority be wrong? Well, show me in the Bible where the majority was ever right. You think the majority of Christians are right on the issue of the state of the dead? No, because it's not scriptural. This is what she says, speaking about those who belong to the churches in the end time. They declared that they had the truth. 
that miracles were among them, that angels from heaven talked with them and walked with them, that great power and signs and wonders were performed among them. And this was the temporal millennium while they had, which they had been expecting so long. The whole world was converted and in harmony with the Sunday law. See what the devil is going to get uh, to confirm the Sunday law. He says, she says, and this little feeble, listen now she refers to the remnant, this little feeble people stood out in defiance of the laws of the land and the laws of God and claimed to be the only ones right on the earth. How can a little remnant be so arrogant as to say that they're the only ones that are right when it comes to the state of the dead? Now, do you know what the devil's capstone of deception is going to be? It's going to be personating the second coming of Jesus Christ. And in a society where people are used to following their senses and their emotions and their feelings, they want all of their religious experience to be a subjective experience, those people will be deluded just like that. We can only stand on God's objective external word, period. If you want to know whether Sabbath or Sunday is a day of rest, don't listen to your ministers. Even to me. Don't follow what other people say. Misquoting of Scripture. Go to the Bible and study it for yourself with prayer. Let the Bible define what the day of rest is, not miracles and signs and wonders, because churches say, oh, we've got signs and wonders in our denomination, in our church. Signs and wonders is no proof that something is of God. Because the devil can counterfeit signs and wonders. You see, Satan is going to come. And he's going to counterfeit the second coming of Christ. Allow me to read from the Spirit of Prophecy, and then I'm going to go to the biblical basis that, where she's coming from. Great Controversy, page 625, she describes this climactic moment as the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. Not impersonate, personate. He will look just like Christ. Now notice, notice why he does it. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. So the devil knows that we're longing for the coming of Jesus. I'm going to fulfill that longing. She says, now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, the basis for this is Matthew 24. If, he's, if they say he's in the desert, don't go. If they say he's in the inner rooms, don't go. That's the biblical foundation. She says, in different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness. Those who go by their eyes, you're a goner. Those who go by their ears, you're finished. She says, the glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come, Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them as Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth. Now listen, his voice is soft and subdued like you would imagine the voice of Jesus, right? The lovely Jesus. His voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. Think the devil can talk with melody? He was the director of the heavenly choirs, folks. He knows all about melody. She continues saying, His voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody and, and in gentle, compassionate tones. He presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. See, he's going to tell some truths. He heals the diseases of the people. And then, in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday. Oh, now, those who are faithful to God's Word are going to say, Ah! That's where he went off track. Actually, when they first see him, they'll know that he's gone off track because Jesus is not going to step upon this earth when he comes again. And now notice, 
I go back a little ways. He claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. And then she says, this is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. Is this a strong delusion? I'm glad she says, almost overmastering delusion. But then she says, but the people of God will not be misled. The teachings of this false Christ are not in accordance with the Scriptures. His blessing is pronounced upon the worshipers of the beast in His image, the very class upon whom the Bible declares that God's unmingled wrath shall be poured out. Ellen White is actually coming from two passages in Scripture. One I mentioned, Matthew 24, verses 23 to 27. If anyone says he's in the inner rooms, don't go. If anyone says he's in the desert, don't go. Because as the flash of lightning flashes from the west unto the east, everyone will see it. The Bible says every eye shall see him. And the Bible says he's not going to touch the earth. He will catch us up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and then He will take us to the Father's house for a thousand years, like He promised Peter and the disciples. So by walking on the earth, the devil is showing that even though he has dazzling brightness, his arguments appear persuasive, his voice is like the voice of Jesus, he does miracles to prove that he's, that he's Christ. By two things, God's people will know that he's not. Number one, he's walking upon the earth contrary to God's word. And number two, he is stating that the day of worship has been changed from Sabbath to Sunday, which is also unscriptural. Go with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 13. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 to 13. Here we find the biblical basis for what Ellen White is saying. You see, the Antichrist is really the devil, and of course he has an earthly emissary who does his dirty work. He remains in the invisible world till after the millennium. It says in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9, the coming of the lawless one. That word coming is parousia, the same word that's used for the second coming of Jesus in verse 1 and in verse 2. It says the coming of the lawless one is going to be how? According to the working of Satan. With how? With all power, signs, and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Why do they perish? Listen. Because they did not receive what? the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Do you know this isn't talking just generally about truth, it's the truth about how Jesus is going to come. Because that's the context. Notice what it says in verse 11. And for this reason God will send them strong delusion. In other words, God will allow them to be deluded. The Bible attributes to God what God allows. People say, I want it this way, God says, okay, I'll step back. Because you have freedom of choice. And so it says that they will be deluded, that they should believe, now notice, not any old lie, that they should believe the lie. What lie are we talking about here? We're talking about the counterfeit second coming of Christ. That lie, because that's the context, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not what? Believe the truth, but had pleasure in what? Pleasure in unrighteousness. Ellen White in Signs of the Times, May 18, 1882, comment about, commented about this passage in 2 Thessalonians 2. Notice what she said. Because the children of men reject the plainest teachings of His Word and trample upon His law, God leaves them to choose that which they desire. God won't force you. If you want to choose error, God will allow it. If you want to accept the devil's delusions, God will allow it. But God gives you plenty of reason not to be deluded and not to be deceived. She continues saying, they spurn the truth, and He permits them, notice, He permits them to believe a lie. They refuse to yield to the convictions of the Holy Spirit, and Satan, transforming himself into an angel of light, leads them captive at his own will. 
If men, now notice the solution, if men were but conversant with the Word of God and obedient to its teachings, they could not be thus deceived. But they neglect, listen carefully, not reject, they neglect the great detector of fraud, and the mind becomes confused and corrupted by the deceptive arts of men and the secret power of the father of lies. If there ever was a time, folks, when we need to be studying our Bibles, it's now. I'm not talking about reading the Bible, I'm talking about studying the Bible. The next couple of sermons I'm going to have here at Fresno Centro, I'm going to be speaking about 12 ways in which the devil tries to keep us from studying the Word of God. Because if you don't study it, you're not going to obey it. It's that simple. You know, sometimes I think that we can't answer the devil, it is written, because we don't know where it's written. And even worse, I think sometimes we can't say it is written because we don't even know if it's written. <laughs> we must be seeped into the study of Scripture. We must study God's Word. It should be our first endeavor to pray and to study God's Word with the spirit of prayer because it is the detector of error. It will keep us from being deceived in these final days. That's why Ellen White said that the first duty of parents is to teach their children the Word of God. First duty at home, pray. Teach them to pray, but teach them to be immersed in the Word of God, which is the protector against error, which is the great detector of error. It is the acid test of every teaching, of every miracle, of every reason, of every feeling, of every emotion, of every sign, of every wonder, of every prophecy. It is the acid test which shows whether something is true or false. May the Lord help us and inspire us to study His Holy Word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the clarity of your Word. Thank you for not leaving us in a world without any guidance. We thank you for a clear compass. We thank you, Lord, for the acid test. We thank you for your Word, that in this world of confusion, this world where people don't know where to turn, we can know exactly how to be founded upon the certain and eternal rock of truth. We thank you, Father, for having been with us this morning, and we ask, Lord, that you will take these words, write them upon our minds and hearts, that it might, they might affect our lives during this coming week. We thank you, Father, for hearing and answering our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, see